The Great Basin is a land of extremes. Shaped by a series of fascinating geographic processes, this mega region is among the most unique places on Earth. Despite this, the Great Basin holds the reputation for being one of the most challenging and inhospitable regions in the world. So what makes this region so dangerous? The Great Basin is an endorheic basin, meaning that water is trapped within the region and is unable to flow into the nearby Pacific Ocean. Instead, the region's water either evaporates into the atmosphere, sinks beneath the permeable soil and rock into underground layers called aquifers, or flows in an endless cycle between rivers and lakes. Because of its cyclical nature, the Great Basin essentially acts as a self-contained world. This self-contained world sprawls across a huge portion of America at a total size of 209,000 square miles. This makes the Great Basin almost the same size as France. All told, the basin includes just about all of Nevada, the western half of Utah, and a large southeastern portion of California. It even extends into small pockets of Oregon and Baja California in Mexico making it by far the largest drainage basin in North America that doesn't actually have an outflow of water. The Great Basin is so vast that it isn't actually a single basin. Instead, it's composed of hundreds of smaller basins, making the Great Basin more of a mega region. So how did a basin this large manage to form in the first place? The answer lies in the Earth's tectonic plates, specifically the North American plate and the Pacific plate. These two plates are pulling away from one another, with the Pacific Plate drifting towards the northwest, while the North American Plate moves in a general west-southwest direction. This moving of plates causes a basin and range topography, which is a unique geographic feature where there is a series of high ridges followed by low flat valleys. Over time, these turn into very dense mountain ranges. The hydrographic Great Basin exists inside two massive mountain ranges, the Sierra Nevada Range to the west and the Rocky Mountains to the east. To the north is a smaller basin called the Snake River Basin. Together, this gives the Great Basin a very distinct border called the Great Basin Divide which functions similarly to the Continental Divide. These mountain ranges have a huge effect on the weather inside the Great Basin. The Sierra Nevada mountain range casts a rain shadow over the region. Due to the height and range of the mountains, most clouds coming from the Pacific Ocean don't make it past the Sierra Nevadas, depriving the Great Basin of a lot of rainfall. As a result, this leads to the formation of several deserts across the region. The Mojave Desert sits at the edge of the Great Basin right beside the Sierra Nevada mountain range. In fact, it's the desert most affected by the rain shadow, making it a hot desert with scorching temperatures and little vegetation. But the largest desert in the Great Basin, and the United States as a whole, is the Great Basin Desert. This is a very large area of land which constitutes about two-thirds of the total area of the Great Basin, though scientists are unable to agree upon its exact size. Basin and range topography is evident throughout the Great Basin Desert, with there being more than 30 peaks throughout the arid region, and with some of the summits being higher than a staggering 10,000 feet. The Great Basin Desert has a colder, more moderate climate. The valleys tend to be warmer and receive limited amount of rainfall. In the more elevated parts of the Great Basin Desert, among the mountain peaks, temperatures are lower and there's considerably greater amount of rainfall. This rainfall trickles down the mountains into the flat valleys below, beginning the endorheic cycle. Once the rain has fallen, there's a massive amount of different paths the water can follow. The water could enter any of the Great Basin's rivers, such as Bear River, which stretches out over 350 miles before entering the Great Salt Lake in Utah. This is the largest saltwater lake in the Western Hemisphere. This figure is constantly changing, however, as the Great Salt Lake is a seasonal lake, meaning a huge portion of the lake routinely dries up due to the intense heat of the region. Water could also run into the Humboldt Basin, this is an area surrounding the Humboldt River, which dominates the Great Basin Desert, running across from the west outside Reno, all the way to the east past Salt Lake City. The Humboldt River is possibly the longest river in the region, though this isn't known for certain due to the meandering nature of the river making it difficult to measure. So, with all of these extreme attributes in mind, from scorching temperatures to unnavigable mountain ranges and valleys, it's obvious that the Great Basin isn't an ideal place for human settlement. Unsurprisingly, the region has, and remains to be, largely uninhabited. But let's check out the history of those who were brave enough to tackle the extreme conditions of the region. For the last time, I'm foregoing a traditional sponsor of this video in order to promote my Substack community. If you enjoy these videos, you're gonna love what I write over on that Substack page. And best of all, it's 100% free 
always and forever. It's just extra articles that tie into the video of the week. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below or scan the QR code. Life can't exist without water. And nowhere is this more true than the Great Basin. The inhospitable conditions of the region have led people throughout history to base their lives around drinking water availability. The earliest habitation of the Great Basin is estimated to have occurred by Paleo-Indian people in roughly the year 10,000 BCE. These were the people who had initially entered the Americas through the land bridge in the Bering Strait between modern day Russia and Alaska. These people slowly migrated down the Pacific coast of North America before reaching the Great Basin. This distinct group of people are known as the Folsom culture. They were nomadic hunter-gatherers, traveling all across the Great Basin despite its challenging terrain. Over time, these native people slowly became less nomadic and instead became fixed on certain areas across the Great Basin. One such area that people settled in was around Lake Lahontan. Lake Lahontan was a large endorheic lake in modern-day Northwest Nevada. It was one of the largest lakes in North America at 8,500 square miles. It was also a consistent water source for the native people at the time, offering them refuge from the otherwise brutal conditions of the region. However, the lake slowly dried up due to the warming climate before disappearing roughly 9,000 years ago. Tiny portions of Lake Lahontan still exist today in the form of the much smaller Pyramid Lake and Walker Lake. Since then, tribes including the Ute, Mono, and Goshute people have ventured farther and farther through the region in search of more hospitable conditions. The range of natives even extended beyond the hydrographic Great Basin, reaching parts of New Mexico, Arizona, Wyoming, and Idaho. This broad culture is collectively known as the Great Basin Culture Area. But as usual, it wasn't long until European settlers arrived in the area. The first documented European contact took place in 1765, when Spanish explorer Juan Maria Antonio de Rivera reached the Great Basin. Over the 1700s and 1800s, more non-native people reached the area. Despite land disputes, America claimed ownership of the Great Basin and the land surrounding it through a series of treaties with other countries. Such treaties included the Spanish Cession in 1819, the Oregon Treaty in 1846, and the Mexican Cession in 1848. It was during this period that the Great Basin got its name, when U.S. Army Major General John C. Fremont explored the region, stating that it was truly a Great Basin. Not long after this, the first large non-indigenous settlement was established in Salt Lake City, which was settled by modern-day Mormons in 1847. These settlers engaged in a series of fights and skirmishes with the Ute people. Then, in 1848, came the California Gold Rush. People flooded across the country to reach California, chasing a dream of a better life. In order to reach California, they had to first travel through the Great Basin. They traveled down the 1,600-mile California Trail, which largely stuck to the Humboldt River. They navigated their way through deserts and over perilous mountains to reach California. However, it was soon discovered that there were precious minerals in the Great Basin as well. In 1859, there was found to be a huge amount of silver in the Virginia Range of Nevada. This was the first major discovery of silver ore in America and came to be known as the Comstock Lode. The population of Virginia City exploded, swelling up to a size of 25,000 in the 1870s. Nevada became so synonymous with silver that it earned its nickname as the Silver State. However, as the supply of silver began to dwindle, many people in the Great Basin decided to migrate further west to California, not only in search of more minerals to mine, but also to escape the extreme heat and unkind conditions of the Great Basin instead yearning for a cooler climate along the Pacific coast. After this, the Great Basin returned to simply being a region that people largely passed through on their way to California. The region continued to be populated by natives, Mormons, and a small scattering of ranchers and miners who were more willing to endure the challenging lifestyle of the region. But today, with all of the progress we've made in modern times, is the Great Basin any more human friendly than it was in the past? Let's find out. In the modern day, there are two major cities in the Great Basin. First, there's Reno in Nevada. This is on the western edge of the Great Basin and holds a population of about 490,000 people in the metro area. Salt Lake City in Utah is the other major city with a population of about 1.3 million people. The population of the region overall is quite difficult to calculate because it doesn't follow county or state borders, but estimates put it somewhere between 8 and 10 million people total. This makes the Great Basin one of the most sparsely populated regions in the entire country. 
Within the region, over half the population live inside metro and urban areas, with these rates steadily increasing. Considering the vast size of the region, this shows us that most people still opt not to face the brutal conditions of the Great Basin, much of which remains completely devoid of human life. Despite the move towards urban living, the people of the Great Basin still face severe water shortages. To combat this, the region's water supply runs on an intricate system of man-made reservoirs and irrigation systems, with over 70% of Nevada and Utah's water being appropriated from this system. One such reservoir is the modern Lake Lohontan, which was formed by the construction of a dam by the Bureau of Reclamation in 1905. Across the region, water is collected in the form of snowfall in the winter and rainfall in the spring. The underground aquifers in the region are also tapped into and have their water supply manually extracted. The water is then transported across the region to homes for drinking water and to farms for agricultural use. So it's safe to say that modern life in the Great Basin is highly dependent on scientific and technologic achievements. To this day, a large percentage of those living in the rural areas of the Great Basin are native people, with 30,000 Native Americans living in the state of Nevada alone. Over the past century, multiple reservations have been established for indigenous peoples, including the Eli Shoshone Reservation, founded in 1930, as well as the Duckwater Reservation, which was established in 1940. However, native people today suffer disproportionately from a number of social issues, such as poverty and unemployment. This is partially due to their isolation. Their reservations within the Great Basin are extremely remote and largely lack the infrastructure to connect them to other areas. As a result of this remoteness, the native people of the Great Basin are often faced with extreme water scarcities and sometimes even encounter problems with their water supply being contaminated with toxic materials. This contamination stems from the mining of minerals within the region. All that said, mining remains as a key sector in the region's economy, as well as silver. Another important element that has since begun being extracted in the Great Basin is lithium, the material that powers basically everything we use today, from computers and phones to vehicles and even homes. Ranching is another key economic sector, with the majority of ranching being done along the Humboldt River, where the soil is more fertile. But these industries are relatively small compared to the vastness of the land. As such, the economy has begun putting more emphasis on tourism, making use of the beautiful and diverse scenery of the region. In the mountains near Salt Lake City, skiing has become a popular pastime. Also, people travel to see the impressive salt flats, which are found west of the Great Salt Lake. And of course, the Great Basin is where the famous Burning Man Festival is held every year. However, there is a problem that's proving to be an increasingly deadly threat for the Great Basin, climate change. As the world becomes warmer, more and more of the region's precious water supply gets evaporated by the heat. The water supply being extracted from underground aquifers is finite and will eventually run out. The water scarcity has always been an issue in the region due to its geographic features, so the issue is only being exacerbated by the rapidly changing climatic conditions. As stated, the Great Basin is a land of extremes. It has always been this way. It's a land of extreme temperature, elevation, beauty, and danger. Despite the unique and fascinating formation of the region, the conditions of the Great Basin are likely to become unsustainable in the near future. Hey, speaking of extreme areas, this week I spent 24 full hours in the world's best airport, Changi International Airport in Singapore. And you should go check out that video over on my other channel if that interests you. I hope you enjoyed learning all about the Great Basin. If you did, be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel as I post new videos like this every single week. If you wanna watch another video, check out this one on the unique demographics of Taiwan. Thanks for watching, see you next time.